morning. My name is Carl Kalpik, and I'm leading you in our devotionals today on the Gospel of John, and I'm trusting that you've read chapter 19 of John, which is our text today. We are doing a series of meditation called SOAP, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. And so I'm going to begin today with my own personal observations on the Gospel of John. It is easy to go with the flow and allow one's conscience to be muffled by other factors. When I see Pilate here, I feel I'm witnessing that struggle. Pilate had the power to release Jesus or have him crucified. He knew Jesus was innocent. At the same time, what would motivate him to release him. In front of him stood a religious council with the power to send word to Caesar that he was releasing a man who claimed to be king. That would be enough to ruin Pilate's career if he released him. Why resist? I can only think that it might be his fear of God, because Pilate is afraid. We learn that in verse 8, when Pilate is told that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, the text says he was even more afraid. Pilate certainly wasn't afraid of killing. This was a man that was not reluctant to spill blood. On the other hand, standing before him was a man about whom he must have heard a great deal. Maybe he'd heard of Lazarus's resurrection from the dead. And like most Romans, he must have had a preternatural fear of anything supernatural. But Pilate also had to think about his career, his reputation with Caesar, and the expectations of these Jewish leaders. At the top of the hierarchy was the high priest Caiaphas, who was high priest, as it turns out, during Pilate's whole 10-year tenure as Roman governor. Caiaphas was a man he had learned to work with. It was a relationship that was mutually beneficial. Caius could send a good or bad report back to Caesar. What could possibly induce Pilate to resist Caiaphas and these leaders and go against the flow? Most people do not sacrifice everything for the sake of conscience. It takes a lot more than a love for virtue. Unless we have nothing to lose, most of us, when it comes to resisting the flow, do so very reluctantly. The crowd yelling, crucify him, went with the flow. This crowd was not made up of the same people, incidentally, who greeted Jesus with hosannas earlier in the week. They were people who had been hand selected by the chief priests to enter the courtyard where the trial was taking place. They knew their tribe, their allegiances, and were not about to have their view of the world upset by a man who claimed to be God's son. The miracles of Jesus were just something to be reasoned away. If their religious leaders objected to Jesus, they wanted nothing to do with him. Rethinking one's loyalties and clan, one's commitments, is too difficult a task for most of us. Our hierarchy and mental landscapes are just too immovable. Unlike P. Pilate, these people's fear of God was muted by familiarity with religious customs. When God seemed to appear in Jesus' miracles, they just shouted louder, away with him. For most people, changing our view of the world and religion is just too costly. Okay, so how do I apply this to my own life? Where can I find the courage to stand against the tide? 
I suppose it must be a daily thing, comprising confession and a careful listening to conscience, then acting on it. Nicodemus in chapter 3 went to see Jesus at night, breaking from his own political and religious class when he did so. In chapter 7, he stood up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin and at the end of this chapter goes to collect Jesus' body. body. It was res he was resisting the tide of his own class, one small step at a time. Little choices day by day help determine our course in the end. I can do that too. I can speak out when I see injustice or when I disagree. Like Nicodemus, I can turn towards something I feel is right, even though to do so is uncomfortable and against my personal comfort. So I'm guessing that I do so very inadequately and that if I were Nicodemus, I would have been heartbroken that I had not somehow managed to stop this crucifixion. I would have wondered on Saturday after Good Friday if I couldn't have done more. But here's the consoling thing. In the end, Nicodemus was saved by grace like any of us by that very death and resurrection of his Lord. He had spoken with Jesus and he had believed. He'd acted in consequence of that belief. Maybe even, you know, I'm wondering, we'll find Pilate in heaven too. Maybe in the end when he put up the sign over Jesus' head that he was king of the Jews, against the idea of the Sanhedrin. Maybe he was declaring his faith. The Ethiopian and Coptic churches both count Pilate a saint after all. Maybe, just maybe, God's grace, Jesus' death on the cross was for him too. Jesus, after all, said quite a little to Pilate in his trial. And his words weren't to keep himself off the cross, but as a way of getting into Pilate's heart. I hope we'll see Pilate in heaven because it's at the cross I run to hide myself and take shelter for my own weaknesses. May God help us all to grow in courage and stand against wrong, to do so day by day in incremental ways. But also may he help us to take refuge in the cross by which Christ in his love stood against the tide for me and took my sins upon him. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your cross is more vast. It is huger than any of us can realize. You know the pressures that we are forced to stand against and how often we succumb to our own weaknesses. Lord, I pray that you'd help us day by day to speak up for what's true to stand for what's right, to go against the flow when people around us are lying to themselves. Pray, Lord, that you'd help us to stand for truth. And at the same time, Lord, we take refuge in you knowing that all of us are sinful. All of us in some ways are cowardly. And we pray that you'd give us the grace to do what is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.